Hi there, I'm Laura from Get Organized HQ and over the years I have consumed tons and tons of organizing content from blogs to social media to Instagram to Facebook to Pinterest to magazines to those organizing TV shows and there are a few organizing secrets that I rarely hear talked about and I think they are so important, especially the first one I'm gonna share with you. If you hear nothing else, make sure you listen to that one because it could be a total game changer for you. Now you may have noticed this really beautifully organized shelf behind me. And I do love this space in my home. I kind of come here when I need that, like to look at something organized, but here's the deal. Yes, this space is organized, but so are lots of other spaces in my home and others that don't look anything like that. There are spaces that you're not gonna see in a magazine and on Instagram and on Pinterest that may not have that same look, but here's the thing. There is no requirement that a space look absolutely beautiful or be color coded or have all matching things or have a bunch of negative space or have decor in order to be organized. I think sometimes it's easy to lose sight of what it means to be organized. So to be organized, you only need two things to have an organized space. Number one, every item needs to have a clear home that everyone who uses the space knows where that home is. And number two, it just has to make you smile. So. You can have a space that looks like this or like this, and they are still both completely organized. So let's not get caught up in thinking that we have to look a certain way to be organized. You just need to give every item a home. And if it has a home and we know where that is, that is completely organized. Now let's go ahead and talk about those really organized spaces that you see on like TV shows and magazines. One thing that is easy to overlook when you're looking at that is that those products actually cost quite a bit of money. Like those really pretty clear acrylic things, you can easily pay like $20 for one bin, or if you want all matching bins, you can easily pay a whole lot of money. In fact, I did a video where I compared organizing my kids kind of craft toy closet using all multi-purpose bins from the container store and using all products from the Dollar Tree. And so we actually did the math and I believe that the container store product organization was like $700 worth of products. And that's not even on the high end. If I'd gone all acrylic, it would have been even more. So just keep in mind that a lot of the things that you see use a lot of pro products that cost quite a bit of money. So if you want that exact same look, you will have to be prepared to make the investment. On the flip side, there are lots of budget options, so don't think just because you don't have $700 to spend on a whole bunch of matching bins that you can't be organized. That's not true at all. You may have picked up on this already from what I've been saying, but one secret that a lot of people don't talk about is those spaces that you see in like magazines or TV shows or even on social media like Instagram or Pinterest, many of them are staged. I mean, literally staged. No one actually uses them. They don't stay that way and they don't always even use the products that the people naturally had on hand. So it would be unrealistic to expect all of your spaces to look like that all the time. I can guarantee you the people that they organize for, it doesn't even look exactly like that all the time. So let's let go of thinking that they should. And really, when it comes to staging those spaces, of course they put it together and they didn't have like time to use it. It's gonna get a little sloppy over time and they're all gonna need some maintenance and some redoing a little bit from time to time. But also, the literal products that they are organizing can also be staged. So you'll notice if you look at pictures, like if you go to the Container Store's website and you look at the photos that they have or even go to the Container Store itself or you look at magazines, the products that they're organizing, they pick those products because A, they are uniform. So they don't have like a box of pasta from Aldi and Kroger and Meyer and Walmart that are all different sizes. They have four matching boxes of pasta and they chose the pasta based on how the packaging looks. So certain packaging just looks more modern and minimal and appealing. And so those people who create those spaces, they're creating them for looks and not for functionality because no one's gonna actually have to use it. If you're setting up a display in a container store, no one's using it. So you can pick the products that actually look beautiful. So you need to keep that in mind because when I organize like my actual pantry, I do not have all the most beautiful packaging that is all matching. I have all different sizes. And so that's something that you're gonna have to deal with. And just note, you shouldn't have your own space looking exactly like the magazine. 
Speaking of secrets, it's no secret that I absolutely love color coding. It's cheap, easy, and quick way to keep everything looking really organized and make it easy to find. So like my clothes in my closet are all color coded in rainbow order. My kids' books are all color coded in rainbow order. But here's what no one talks about. It's a little harder to do sometimes than it sounds. Now, I don't think that means you shouldn't do it if you want to, but I just want you to be realistic about it, that it can be stressful, especially for kids. And let me tell you why. All right, so the first reason why, like these are some books I picked out from my daughter's bookshelf. Uh, what color would you call that? I mean, it's kind of brown, it's kind of purple, and I literally stress out about whether or not this belongs with the browns or with the purples. I don't know. So that can be tricky. There's several books like that. Here's another one that like the outside of it looks really pink, but this could almost read peachy. I'm not really sure. So like, and then when you're trying to go with intensity, like brightest to lightest, it can be tricky. Oh, and then this is probably the most frustrating. What do you do with this? Is this red orange or is this blue? I don't know. Um, my advice would be to pick whether or not you're gonna go by the top half of the book or the bottom half of the book, so you at least are consistent with that, but it could read either way. So that can get a little bit confusing or frustrating. Um, here's another one that has like a lot of another color down at the bottom. Then we have the situations with these really, really thin books. I mean, this one is so thin, it almost doesn't even have a spine. So like, I guess you should put it with whites, but it's a judgment call. Um, a lot of times I keep these thin books all by themselves. Um, this is another one that's really thin, although I still think it's a clear red. So I just think that it's wise to realize when you're color coding, it is a judgment call and it can be a little bit tricky. And that's not the only solution. Like it would make perfect sense to me as well to like order your books by size or by type or alphabetical order by author. The one thing I will say though, is when dealing with kids, especially the younger the kid is, I mean, I don't even know the authors of half the book. So trying to organize it like a library is kind of impractical. And you know, maybe not all of you have a book problem like I do, but literally I buy my kids tons of books because we love to read. So we have so many that that's just a little bit impractical and color is gonna be the easiest way for the youngest kids to know how to put them away. You just have to be willing to realize that it's not gonna stay perfect. And if you can accept that, then I think it works really well. So it's pretty natural and normal that we put a lot of focus on getting our spaces exactly the way that we want. And then we take a picture, show it off online, but it's easy to neglect to think about actually keeping the space that way. And really and truly, I honestly think that maintenance is a little bit harder than even the initial setting it up. You can just put forth a burst of energy, set aside a Saturday or something and get your space looking just the way you want it. But then to keep that up, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year is the real challenge. So we need to be putting just as much energy and focus on how to keep it that way as we are and getting it set up that way in the first place. And I have lots I could say about how to help with this, but the most important tip that I can give you is to set it up in a way that makes it easy for you to maintain. It may not be what would be easier for someone else, but what is it that you yourself can maintain the best and just think about what, are there any spaces that have stayed and why? Um, is it because it's super organized? Is it because it's actually not as micro organized and you can just toss things in? What is it gonna, what is it gonna take to make it easy for you to organize? And then get in that daily habit of putting the items away back in their home because that's what's gonna make all the difference. And if that is too much of a challenge, like maybe it's something you're using all the time and you find yourself not putting them back, then you need to do the daily clutter checks where you maybe even set a reminder on your phone, like in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening to go put everything in that away, in that space away. And then that'll, as you start doing that, you will naturally find yourself putting those things away more because you're already creating that habit of constantly putting them away. And you know, if you don't do it now, that alarm is gonna go off in an hour or two and you're gonna have to do it anyway. So that's my advice for keeping those spaces organized. Almost every single piece of content that I have ever read or I myself have created about organizing always says this, start with decluttering. That's actually perfect advice. I am glad we talk about that a lot because we absolutely should. And once you get rid of something, you'll never have to deal with it again. It's really hard to organize true clutter. So definitely do that. But there's a side of that that I feel like I hear talked about a lot less often. And that is 
pay attention and be really intentional about what you're bringing back into the home because you could spend so much time decluttering and getting rid of what you don't need. But if you're bringing things back in at the same rate, you're never going to actually make real progress and make a dent in that clutter. So let's focus on what we bring back in. So for me, I kind of enjoy shopping. Like I don't mind even grocery shopping. I don't mind. It's like browsing the aisles, looking at Target, what's new in home decor. There's something about Target and home decor that like you just keep adding the stuff to your cart <laughs> and then you get it home and you're like, oh, it looked really good in the store, but I'm not exactly sure where to put that or like it doesn't exactly match, things like that. So let's be really intentional. Clothing is another huge one that I think a lot of us you know, you, you see it in the store and it looks good on the mannequin, it looks good on the rack. And we almost kind of imagine like, I want to be a person who wears this, but if it's not actually what I wear, if it's not comfortable for me, if it's not my color, it's too loud or it's too muted, or I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable, like I, I don't know, for whatever reason, then you're probably gonna buy the item and let it hang on your shelf and never wear it. So be really intentional about what comes back into the home and another thing that helps me a lot with this that you might not think about is be very ready, eager to return things. So if I do buy that decor item from Target, first of all, I need to use it right away. I don't need to like just set it in a pile and a month or two or three later get to it. I immediately see where that item could fit in. If for some reason I was wrong and it doesn't look good, I immediately return it. Same with clothing. I thought it looked great, but after I wear it for five minutes, it's uncomfortable, it's scratchy. It actually doesn't look good with the skirt that I thought it would. I immediately return it. So if you do make that buying decision, don't wait three months, six months, a year when it's too late to return it, return it right away. Not every item has to be used for its intended purpose. So you can reuse a lot of items. For example, binder clips. I mean, obviously they're designed to hold your papers together and they're great at that, but they have several other uses as well. First of all, you can hold a cord together for organizing it and not making it like all unraveled and tangled with one of those binder clips. You can also use binder clips to seal your like open food bags like crackers or chips. So you don't have to go out and buy a dedicated product for those purposes. And also binder clips are a lot cheaper than like a specific cord control product. In addition to that, another thing that I like to reuse are boxes. Like boxes can be so versatile, especially if you don't want to invest a whole lot of money or you don't have a whole lot of money to invest in organizing bins and things. You can totally use boxes like shoe boxes. For example, you could organize with those, or I've seen people cut down like cereal and cracker boxes and make drawer dividers. If you have any Apple boxes, like an iPhone and iMac and iPad, those are really good quality sturdy boxes and are amazing drawer dividers. And I've had a couple that just fit my drawer better than anything else. So those are also great ways. You can also dress them up if you really want them to look nicer. I've seen people cover them with like contact paper, wrapping paper, cardstock and mods, Mod Podge so that they look nice or you can label them, whatever you want to do. Also, anytime you have consistent boxes, like for example, diaper boxes, if you have kids and you're probably going to go through several boxes of diapers and a lot of times you might buy the same brand. So those will be very consistent looking and can look really nice in a closet. But I want to give you one little caveat here before you go crazy thinking, oh, I can do all these amazing things with all these boxes. I'm going to save them. Only save them if you're actually going to use them and you know exactly what you're going to use them for. What I don't want you to do, and I say this because I've been guilty of this, is just go start saving all the boxes you have and then add to your clutter and not know what to do with them. So if you know, for example, I plan to organize this drawer by using cracker and cereal boxes, then you save those for a while until you have enough and you make that project. When you're done with that, if you don't plan to use that for another drawer, get rid of whatever you didn't use. So don't let this be an excuse for clutter. This is one of the most practical things I've done in my own home to control the clutter. And I'm kind of surprised I don't hear this talked about more often. And that is that I have what I call inboxes and outboxes. Now, a lot of times we think of this like in our email, we can have an inbox or an outbox or even for paper, but I mean for everything. Like every closet has an inbox and an outbox for the most part. And like my office has an inbox and an outbox. So this means the inbox is for when new stuff comes in that doesn't have a home yet. It goes in the inbox until I can deal with it when I have time. So that avoids me just shoving random things like 
setting them on a flat surface or shoving them under my bathroom sink, like my makeup and not being able to find it. Instead, I intentionally put it in the inbox that saves me tons of time. And then I can go through and find a proper home for it. Same with like kids' closets, offices, and of course, paper needs an inbox because we have so much coming in. And then on the same token, we have an outbox. That's just a declutterer box that you have easily accessible. If you have a bin, for example, in your child's closet for clothes that they have outgrown or they don't like anymore, it's so much easier than if you just have to go, even if you have to take a few steps, especially if it's downstairs or some, some, for some reason, I feel like we're all kind of allergic to stairs. Um, so in that case, you're going to be so much more likely to immediately put that item in. And then I have been guilty before I had these inboxes and outboxes of like, okay, my kid has outgrown these jeans. They just look ridiculous and I don't want them to wear them anymore. But since I didn't have that outbox and I wasn't in the mood to like go walk across the house or put them in the donate bin in the car, I just kind of set them aside and made a little pile in their closet. And then I forget them. Like, what is this pile for? Or worse, the child finds it and wants to wear them and for whatever reason thinks this is the only thing on planet earth they can possibly wear today. And then you have that whole debacle. Instead, solve the problem with very clear inboxes and outboxes. And I actually have an entire video dedicated to just this concept. So I'll put the link down below if you're interested in learning more about that. I have a unique way of organizing, especially my most used spaces that has been a total game changer for me. And I know for many people who have used it, it's called reverse organizing. And I have a really short and simple video showing you how to do it. So go ahead and watch that video next. It's right over here or it's also linked down below.